once again for getting us fantastic speakers. Jonah comes to us with some of the best credentials I've seen. I actually was so impressed, I printed out uh, a little bit of his resume for you all to look at. Um, hung out with guys like, what, Abby Hoffman and Allen Ginsberg, and um, he may have forgotten more than he remembers at this point in time. But uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing Jonah and the Jonettes. I think that's his groupies. <laughs> you can cut me off now and just come take it over, Jonah. There you go. Yay. Yay. So I'll give you the microphone. If you want to use the microphone, that's great, or you can yell at us. No, I think I'll use the microphone. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here. Um, since last uh, February, I've been speaking and writing almost continuously about Jack London. This is my last scheduled talk. It gives me the opportunity to look, at, look back at what I've been doing, and perhaps it will give you a behind-the-scenes look into the world of Jack London today. What I have to say is personal. Uh, in some ways, that's inevitable. My own life has been entwined around the life and the work of Jack London for some time. I live in Sonoma County because of Jack London. About 40 years or so, I came to visit my parents who had moved from Huntington, Long Island to Occidental. When I asked my father why Sonoma County, he said, if it was good enough for Jack London, it will be good enough for your mother and me. One of the first places they took me was the state park. I've been back dozens of times. I've even been inside the ruins of Wolf House. My friend Greg Hayes, who was a ranger for decades, had a key. He unlocked the lock and we went inside all the way into the back where the fire was supposed to have started. 2016 has been the biggest year ever for Jack London since his death in 1916. It's been the biggest year for me. I've spoken a dozen times from here to San Francisco and back. I've published half a dozen articles, and I've been interviewed for radio in England and Germany and TV for France. All around the world, and not just here, there has been deep interest in London, though we're at the epicenter here. On the whole, Europeans are more interested in Jack's politics, and specifically his socialism, than Americans. Though this past year, given the race for the presidency, I found that audiences have been more open to talking about race, ethnicity, class, gender, and sex than ever before in recent memory. I think that's a good thing if only because to understand Jack, it helps to understand his politics, his social, cultural, and racial views. The year started off rough for me, but I'm used to it. I'm the black sheep in the London world, or maybe I'm the wolf in the London world. I don't mind being a wolf. London himself signed his letters, Wolf. Built a mansion he called Wolf House at Beauty Ranch. Wolf. In January of this past year, I published a booklet entitled The Mysteries of Jack London, Socialist, White Supremacist, Anti-Semite, and Lover of Beauty. Some people didn't like any of those labels applied to their hero, except perhaps Lover of Beauty, though even that sober cat sounded suspect to some of them. It makes him sound a bit shishi. All that the London fans wanted attached to his name was the one word, genius. I wanted to tackle all the thorny issues surrounding him and his work. I might have succeeded in doing that. It's not my place to say, others can judge. After my controversial essay, I was invited to talk about London, to be on the radio and write articles. So I don't think I was excluded or censored or anything like that. In fact, a lot of people prefer controversy. My articles appeared in the Chronicle, the Valley of the Moon magazine, 
and the North Bay Bohemia. I was on the radio in Santa Rosa and long distance from Berlin. Here are some of the highlights from the past year, the year of Jack, though I suppose some might want to call it the year of Donald Trump. Along with teachers from Star Thistle, I took 60 or so seven and eight year olds to the park. We, their teachers and I, told them they couldn't wander. There were rattlesnakes and there was poison oak. They didn't listen. They went wild as soon as they passed the parking lot. One of the teachers explained to me that seven and eight year olds have short attention spans and that I could not speak for more than a few minutes and reasonably expect them to stay tuned. I kept it short. I said that London wrote 50 books in about 16 years, that he had been a hobo before he settled down and became a writer, and that he died at the age of 40. The kids were intrigued. How was he able to write 50 books in less than half that time, they wanted to know. He had a vivid imagination, I said, and they nodded their heads. They knew about the imagination. Why did he die at 40, I was asked. That's a tough question to answer. Biographers have been debating the cause of London's death for 100 years. I couldn't go into the, all the complexities. I kept it simple again. Well, I said he just burned himself up. He used up all his energy, and he wasn't sad when he left the world. What could I tell them about hobos? A couple of boys wanted to know. I explained that as a teenager, London had rode the rails, the railroad for free, and when he needed a place to sleep and food to eat, he'd knock on the door and tell a story that would work up sympathy for him and his cause. Before I could finish my account, half a dozen or so kids tried the word hobo. The hills practically round with the word which they had never heard before. A great many of them wanted to ride the rails. A few of them had read books by Jack. I was delighted to hear that. Many adults would complain to some Woodland Star who loved The Call of the Wild and White Fang and who looked forward to reading more of his books when they grew up. After all these years, Jack London is still in large part a writer for young people, a writer of tales of adventure, but he's also much more than that. On November 22nd, 2016, I moderated a panel about London and his work in San Francisco. On the panel was London's great-granddaughter, Tornell Abbott, a retired Bay Area librarian who has only recently come out of the London closet. She had known for years about her famous ancestor, but she had never said anything about him and then she became involved with the Occupy movement in Oakland and read for the first time London's novel, The Iron Heel, published in 1908, in which he describes the coming of a dictatorship in the United States and the termination of civil rights and civil liberties. It's a forerunner of George Orwell's 1984. Like many readers around the world, The Iron Heel is Tarnall's favorite Jack London book. Indeed, she sees it as a prophetic work of fiction that outlined the rise of fascism. I have some issues with Tarnall. She tends to whitewash his flaws and doesn't really want to acknowledge the fact that he frequently made racist comments about blacks and Jews and Chinese and Japanese and that he wrote an influential essay entitled The Yellow Peril, in which he warned readers that the Chinese and the Japanese would form an alliance and undermine U.S. power and hegemony. He wanted the U.S. to be prepared for war. He also wanted the U.S. to govern Mexico. He said in print that Mexicans weren't capable of governing themselves. In November, I also spoke at the Mechanics Library in San Francisco, which made me feel I was back in the time of London. I spoke at the Sonoma Valley branch of the library. Before my talk, I noticed a custodian repairing a faucet in the building. I really appreciate you keeping this old building running, I told him, and he said, I really appreciate that you do your part for literature. Maybe he had seen me before. Maybe he knew who I was. So 
sometimes one's own infamy precedes one. He went on to ask, have you ever read The Road? And before I could answer, he told me, it's a wonderful book. London describes its adventures as a hobo. Where else in the world, I wondered, would a custodian come up to me and ask if I read The Road? I don't think there are any other places in the world where that could happen except here, near the very heart of the Jack London world. And quite rightly so, given the fact that the park is just down the road and that people from all over the world come here on what might be called literary pilgrimages, pilgrimages to honor the man who wrote 50 books in 16 years, books that have been translated into more than 100 languages in the last 100 years. The last piece that I wrote about London was published in the Chronicle. What I said in those pages and what I'm going to say here and now because it's, I think it's worth repeating is that Jack London was a California writer, a Northern California writer in particular and specifically a Bay Area author. The Bay Area was Jack London's spawning grounds and his backyard. He played here and he worked here as a fisherman and as an oyster pirate and as a member of the fish patrol. In San Francisco Bay itself and in the cities, towns, mountains, and valleys that surround it, London saw a reflection of the whole universe much as he saw the vastness of life in a single poppy. In a 1902 lyrical essay entitled The Golden Poppy, he wrote a love song to the state flower and to the spectacular landscape in which it thrived. Surrounded by a poppy field in bloom in the hills of Oakland, London describes the city of San Francisco across the bay, Mount Tamalpais in Marin the Golden Gate as yet unbridged, and the Pacific Ocean that he would sail on his own sloop, the Snark. Beneath lies all the world, London wrote, and meant readers to take him, both literally and figuratively. Recently, documentary filmmakers like Ben Goldstein and scholarly biographers like Earl Labor have portrayed London, quote, as an American original, and as a walking, talking advertisement for, quote, the American life. In the rush to turn him into a writer with national ties and national appeal, I think they've neglected to see and appreciate him as a native son of the Golden West and as a loyal citizen of the Bay Area in particular. In 1900, when Houghton Mifflin, his stuffy Boston publisher, asked him for a biography he dispatched a letter in which he described himself, quote, as a bay-faring adventure, and hastened to add, he hastened to add, quote, San Francisco is no mill pond, by the way. Bostonians, he assumed, might not have known different. Moreover, in that same letter, London listed the jobs he'd taken in and around the bay, salmon fisher, schooner sailor, and longshoreman. Before he turned to the typewriter, he worked at hard physical labor in an era when the Bay Area boasted factories, shipyards, working class neighborhoods with lively cultures, radical politics, and trade union movements. The Bay Area gave birth to London and nurtured him until his death. Born in San Francisco in 1876, he grew up in Oakland, brought, bought property, created Beauty Ranch, and died in Glen Ellen. He returned the love that California showered on him by writing about it lovingly in essays like The Golden Poppy and in original works of fiction like Martin Eden, The Valley of the Moon, The Star Rover, and the Iron Heel. Even when he reveals the dark side of the Golden State, prisons and betrayals and greed and great sorrow, it's with a sense of compassion and empathy and not with the intent of desecrating California. The Call of the Wild and White Fang both take place in the Yukon, but Call begins in California and White Fang ends there. The Star Rover begins and ends in San Quentin. Martin Eden unfolds in Oakland and San Francisco. The narrator in the Iron Heel tells a riveting tale about dictators.